صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب الغرباء يا مذلوم كربنا السلام على من جعل الله الشفاء في تربته السلام على من الإجابة تحت قبته السلام على ساكن كربنا فيا ليتنا ثم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي يا سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إن لقتل الحسين حرارة في قلوب المؤمنين لا تبرد أبدا صدق النبي وآمنا به نوروا مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد like to begin first and foremost by thanking each and every one of you for making this effort to attend and participate in the reviving the grief of Ali Muhammad and that there is not a single act which is done in the way of Sayyid al-Shuhada that is not recorded by Sayyid al-Shuhada that does not come to the attention of Sayyid al-Shuhada Mu'mineen, Mu'minat, Hani and Lakum Congratulations to you for when you return back home tonight there is a scroll of deeds written by the Malaika, a list in which there is the name of the people who have attended and have wept over this tragedy of Imam al Hussein. And this list is taken up towards the Arsh. Sayyid al Shuhada, seated by the right of the Arsh, gets this list and registers your name for Jannah. Understand the value of these majalis and the value of these gatherings and these seatings. A person as despicable as me, a sinner that I am, impure that I am, as Imam al Hussein looks at my name. We have within the hadith, Imam al-Baqir salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi wa 
in a part of his narration, he talks about Imam al Hussein and he says, وَإِنَّهُ لَا يَرَى مَنْ يَبْكِيهِ فَيَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُ Indeed, Sayyidah Shuhada looks at those people who were weeping for him and he seeks forgiveness for them. If anything, we should have that yaqeen that no matter how many sins we may have, today Sayyidah Shuhada, inshaAllah, seeks forgiveness for us. And from here then it becomes our responsibility that we try as much as possible and we ensure that we don't let the Imam down such that he has to intercede for the same sins that we committed in the past. This is one. Number two, a gratitude towards respected reciters and organizers for this majlis, for this gathering. <coughs> I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Sayyid al-Shuhada, fulfills all your supplications, fulfills all your needs and your desires for yourselves and for your families, and inshallah grants you the best of the dunya as well as the akhirah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Ahibai tashayyu' Shiism in its entirety is dependent upon two institutions and two establishments. So long as these two establishments are adhered to, are kept alive and commemorated and their spirit implemented, you find that Shiism in itself can never be obliterated from this dunya. Yani the continuance of this faith is dependent on two prime establishments. One is the establishment of Ghadir, and the other is the establishment of Ashura. You find that our entire madhab is built on these two institutions. The institution of Ghadir that marks the wilaya of Mawlana Amir al muminin and the event of Ashura that marks the martyrdom of Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al Hussein. My message to you, my brothers and sisters, the continuance of this faith is built upon these two institutions. And when you look at the history of this deen, and you look at the mannerisms in which this deen has survived from generation to generation, you will find that the enemies of Islam, the enemies of Tashayyu, have always attacked these two institutions. They have attacked the institution of Ghadir and they have tried to attack the institution of Ashura. Throughout history, you will find that the challenge has been to attack Ghadir and attack Ashura. Why? Allah Azza wa Jal has decided that the door to guidance is incorporated within Ghadir, the wilaya of Amir al muminin and the Ashura, the martyrdom of Sayyid al-Shuhada. How many people have found the true path through the message of Ghadir? How many people have been inspired to the true path through the message of Ashura? And therefore you find that the forces of Shaitan and all the other Abalish have concentrated all their efforts to attack and to create doubts in regards to this issue of Ghadir and this issue of Ashura. Which is why as a response if we understand this, we uphold the message of Ghadir and the message of Ashura twice as much stronger. Not only is the establishment and the continuance of this madhab based on Ghadir and Ashura, our identity is built on Ghadir and Ashura. 
and Tashi'i Muwali who hopes to be from amongst the Ansar and the Ashab of Imam al hujjah There are two aspects that are ingrained within your personality. There are two aspects within every heartbeat. And those two aspects are from the aspects of Ghadir and Ashura. Your personality should scream out, Aliyun Waliyullah. Your personality should cry out, Ya Hussein. And this is what these Majalis are built for and meant for. This is that culture that we are supposed to nurture within ourselves. Our message and our responsibility towards Ghadir number one, the Wilaya of Amirul Mu'mineen. Building our love and our loyalty for this master. Amirul Mu'mineen. And the door of all tragedies in Islam began from here, when people abandoned Amir al-Mu'mini. A people who perhaps loved Amir al-Mu'mini, but that love was not staunch enough to give birth to loyalty. Loyalty towards Amir al-Mu'mini entails Facing the entire dunya, facing everything within the realm of wujud, within the realm of existence, being ready to face any and every opposition, just so that you can stand alongside your master. Our loyalty towards Amir al-Mu'mineen needs to be cemented. Our love for Amir al-Mu'mineen needs to be cemented. Our knowledge about Amir al Respected brothers and sisters, we can try to understand Amir al from a number of perspectives. You can try to understand Amir al by analyzing his actions from a number of fields, from the fields of psychology and the field of medicine and from the art of war and so on and so forth. You can try and understand Amir al-Mu'mineen through the eyes of historians that were loyal to him. And you can try and understand Amir al-Mu'mineen from the works of historians that never accepted him. There are many avenues through which you can understand Amir al-Mu'mineen. But one of the best ways to understand Amir al Mu'mineen, in order to be able to build this love and loyalty that is matloob, that is necessary, is to understand Amir al Mu'mineen through the Quran. Understand Amir al Mu'mineen in the way that Allah Azza wa Jal, the creator of Ali, understand Ali through the words of the creators of Ali. Mufassirin of the Quran have come forward, both from the Amma and the Khassa, who come forward with writings of close to 1,000 verses revealed in the Quran in honor of Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 1,000 verses that describe Amir al Mu'minin. 1,000 verses through which we are able to understand Amir al Mu'minin. It becomes our responsibility that we increase our knowledge and we understand Amir al-Mu'mineen through the Quran. And number two, do whatever is possible within our powers, with hikmah, with wisdom, and with love. Invite people towards the wilayah of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Tabli. One. Number two, the institution of Ashura and the commemoration of the martyrdom of Sayyidah Shuhada. This grief, these, these tears 
and this weeping and this lamentation, this wailing and this screaming are from the alamat of a mu'min. You see, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe. You find how many verses in the Quran that begin with this verse? Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, and then a particular message comes out. It becomes important that we recite Quran with tadabbur. When the Lord of the universe says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who believe. O oh, you who have Iman, it becomes important for me to ask myself what are the characteristics of the people who have Iman because this khitab is a khitab khas. It is particular. This call is particular to a group of people who have a certain type or certain aspect, certain characteristics within them. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, O you who have Iman. Who are those who have Iman? In other words, what is the definition of a Mu'min? What are the traits and the characters of a Mu'min? You find the literature left behind by Ahlul Bayt gives us a number of perspectives and a number of dimensions, number of characters that a Mu'min has. But Rasulullah identifies one outstanding trait of a Mu'min. In this hadith sharif mentioned in Mustadrak al Wasail, the Holy Prophet of Islam says, Inna li katlil Hussein, Hararatan fi kulubil mu'minin la tabrudu abada. Indeed, for the killing of Hussein, Inna li katlil Hussein, Inna adawat al ta'akid, yani a particle denoting absolute occurrence. Indeed, for the killing of Imam al Hussein, indeed, for the killing of Hussein, in the al Hussein, Hararatan, there is a burning heat. Fi kulubil mu'minina, Allah. Rasulullah, the Messenger of Islam, says, indeed, for the killing of Imam al Hussein, there is a burning heat within the hearts of the mu'mineen. This kalam is muqayyad, is restricted to a certain group of people. He didn't say fi kulubin nas, and he didn't say fi kulubin muslimin. He said there is a burning heat in regards to the killing of Imam al Hussein, a burning anguish within them in their hearts. Where in the hearts of the mu'mineen, meaning that one of the character, one of the sifat of a mu'min is that he has a burning heat and a burning rage inside his heart due to the manner and for the manner in which Imam al Hussein was killed. You want to measure the extent of Iman in your heart? Measure the temperature of this heat, harara, this burning anguish in your heart for Imam al Hussein. It's the words of Rasulullah. And this is a heat that can never be extinguished. Inna li katlil Hussein, harara tan fi kulubil mu'minina, la tabrudu abada. Again, Rasulullah emphasizes with this word abada. It can never be extinguished, this heat. Even Yawm al Qiyamah, we shall cry for Imam al Hussein. And this is within the traditions of Ahlul Bayt. We are faced with a number of challenges, and a number of obstacles in this day and age challenges in regards to our faith and our values and our belief system but i say to you as believers as youth do not ever feel ashamed of crying for imam al hussein do not ever feel embarrassed to cry for imam al hussein do not let any type of research or any type of culture come and tell you that crying is a sign of weakness. 
We don't believe in an atheistic culture. If crying was a sign of weakness, then perhaps the weakest man to walk this earth was Amir al-Mu'minin. Is there any doubt in the bravery of Amir al-Mu'minin, a celebrated warrior that the world has never seen the likes of, a man of religion who has defended the principles of religion in a manner that no other divinely sent man has defended religion, the most courageous person to have walked this earth. When he went into battle, his name in itself caused fear in the people. This name, Haider. This Amir al Mu'minin wept for Imam al Hussein. Do not let a culture come and persuade you or try and distract you away or take away this culture of weeping that has been granted to us by Allah. Invite people towards Imam al Hussein through these tears. Strengthen your nafs through these tears. Positive, the power within this tear. Imam al Sadiq says that the single tear shed in the way of Imam al Hussein is so powerful that if it were to be dropped on the fires of Jahannam, it would extinguish the fire of hell in its entirety. Do you know what is the fire of hell? A fire of hell whose fuel is men and stones. A fire which is ignited due to the wrath of the creator of the universe. And we cannot comprehend that fire of Jahannam. Imagine the power within this tear that it can extinguish this entire fire. The power of this tear, again, Imamain as sadiqain they say, that this tear which is the size of the wing of a fly that comes out of your eye is enough to get you into Jannah. Do you know what are the indications behind these narrations? That the tear in itself is powerful enough to induce a revolution within you. If you are looking for change, if you are looking to be motivated to be more compliant in your religion, if you are looking for inspiration in order to become more God conscious, if you are looking for inspiration in order to fulfill your obligation towards Ahlul Bayt, then weep for Imam Al Hussein because even a tear as small as the fly of a wing, if it can be powerful enough to extinguish the fire of hell, believe me it is strong enough to induce within you revolution to change and for this reason the Imams Aimma of Ahlul Bayt have emphasized that these majalis of weeping must continue till the day of judgment the thawab is written for you even before the tear comes out of the eye Nafasul Mahmoom Lidulmina Tasli. The breath of a person who's overcome by grief due to the oppression that befell Ahlul Bayt. Imam al Sadiq says is counted as Tasli. <coughs> Your breath. Sitting in this majlis listening to oratory and poetry. And as your grief builds in, in the moment you have not even started crying and the malaika have started reciting and recording for you praises of Allah, glorifying Allah, tasbih. These majalis are majalis of ibadat. Do not underestimate the importance of these. These are majalis that were established and loved by Imam Zainul Abidin. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi.
The request is to recite or to shed some light on the tragedies of Imam Zainul Abidi. This is Imam Sajjad for 34 years after Karbala. There was not a single time that food was placed in front of him except that he wept. There was not a single time that water was brought in front of him except that he wept. The narrations mention that his weeping was so intense he would weep until he falls to the brink of death. One time a servant comes to him and says to him, Ibn Rasulullah, grandson of the Holy Prophet, until when will you weep over the tragedy of Karbala? 30 years later, Imam Zainul Abidin looks at him and he says, Oh man, Ayyub wept over his son until his hair became white and his back became bent. He wept to an extent that he lost his eyesight when he knew that his son Yusuf was alive, but the grief of separation made him blind due to this intense grief. Then what about me when I saw 17 members of my family slain in front of my eyes, lying headless on the plains of Karbala? Imam Zainul Abidin taught us that anything and everything you do should remind you of Imam Al Hussein. Imam Zainul Abidin taught us that even a task as simple as going to the butcher should remind you of Imam Al Hussein. The narrations mention, the historians mention at one time he stands by the market in a section of the market where there are butchers. And they take forward their sheep to slaughter them. Imam Zainul Abidin stands in front of them. He looks at this butcher taking forward the sheep such that he may slaughter. Imam Zainul Abidin begins to weep and wail in the market. The butcher says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, grandson of Rasulullah, why is it that you weep and wail in the market? Imam Zainul Abidin tearfully looks at him and says to him, Oh man, did you feed this animal, this sheep, with water? <laughs> Do you know what is heartbreaking? The answer of the butcher. Do you know what the butcher said? He said, Ya Abna Rasulullah, we are Muslims. <laughs> he said, Ya Abna Rasulullah, we are Muslims. <laughs> We do not slaughter any sheep except that we feed it with water, except that we quench its thirst. Imam Zainul Abidin looks towards Karbala and cried out, Assalamu alayka ya Abba Abdullah. He says, how oppressed is my grandfather who was beheaded, who was slaughtered while he was thirsty by people who claim to be Muslims. How oppressed, wallah, how oppressed is the grandson of Rasulullah. The sheep are not sacrificed without water. The grandson of Rasulullah was killed thirsty. I want to mention for you from the tragedies of Imam al Hussein three tragedies that he witnessed in his life as a result of which his grief became eternal. 34 years of Messiah, 34 years of grief. I want to mention for you three incidences of grief that Imam Sajjad never forgot. In fact, three times in his life, Imam Sajjad almost died out of grief. The first incident is the incident when they were entering into Sham as prisoners. <laughs> and you are in the doors of the, these are the days of Sham, 30th of Muharram, 1st of Safar. We are in these days. The historians mention that Ahlul Bayt entered into Sham on the 1st of Shahr al Safar. 
brought in as prisoners. The narrations mention that the women were tied with ropes around their hands and around their necks. There was a single rope that was tied across the necks of all the women. Between every adult woman there was a child and a single rope connected between the neck of the adult and the neck of the child. Which means that if the adult wants to stand up straight they would choke the child. Zainab al-Kubra entered into Sham in almost like a state of Ruku bending down such that she doesn't choke Rukaya behind her. In this manner that they are entering into Sham, the heads of the Shuhada are lifted on spears. And the very first of the spears is the head of Imam al Hussein. A caller calls out to the people of Sham to come out in celebration. For three days, this city has been celebrated. The people are beating drums and celebrating and laughing and dancing in the faces of the women and the children of Ahlul Bayt. As the head of Imam al Hussein is brought on a spear, Sayyida Um Kulthum narrates this. She says that a Khariji woman, one who was from the enemies of Amir al Mu'minin, an old woman, Kharijiya. She comes out and she asks, Whose head is this on the spear? Shimar al Lain says to her that this is the head of Hussein ibn Ali. She turns around and she says, Hussein, the son of which Ali? He says, Ali ibn Abi Talib. She said to Shimar al Lain, she says to him, that my husband was killed by Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Sifin. Will you give me an opportunity to seek revenge from Ali on this day? Shimar al Lain, Shimar bin Dil Joshan says, seek revenge from for what Ali did to you from the head of Imam al Hussein. The historians mention that the, because the heads were raised up on spears, she climbed up to the top of her roof where she had a close view of the head of Imam al Hussein on the spear. Your Sayyidina Um Kulthum says that this woman picked up a stone in her hand. <laughs> This woman picked up a stone in her hand with all the power that she had. She threw the stone on the head of Abu Abdullah. Sayyida Ul Kulthum says one of the miracles from the head of Imam Al Hussein is that as soon as that stone hit the head of Imam Al Hussein, blood began to flow from the forehead. Sayyida Ul Kulthum says the manner in which the woman threw the stone was with so much power the head of Imam Al Hussein fell from the spear onto the ground. At this moment, Imam Al Sajjad fell down to the ground and said, Ya Hussein! <laughs> the Alim says, I don't know what went through the heart of Sajjad. When he saw the head of Imam Al Hussein rolling in the bazaar of Shah, he cried out, Father, let me hold your head, but my hands are tied together. <laughs> May Allah have mercy on your tears. May Allah have mercy on your tears. May these tears be the reason for us to enter into Jannah. May these tears be a reason for us to be in the camp of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Sadiq says that when a person cries for Imam al Hussein, these tears are counted as condolences that are sent to Sayyidina Fatima. Allah. This says the one of the hadith when you shed tears for Imam al Hussein, they're sent as a condolence to Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. She feels in comfort, she feels relaxed that there are people to cry for her son. I tell you, O oh Shia, make Sayyidah Fatima happy because this woman didn't have happiness in her life. Perhaps today you will bring a smile on the face of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. Perhaps she will hold a broken rib and say, Alhamdulillah.
The second moment where Imam Sajjad almost died in his life out of grief. The second moment the narrations mentioned that when they were in the Darbar of Sham, Allah, when they are inside the dungeon of Sham and they are in imprisonment, this prison was a prison which was like a dungeon. An underground dungeon you could think of as, but a dungeon without a roof. So they were not protected from the heat of the sun during the daytime and neither were they protected from the coldness of the desert nights. Imam al-Sajjad is in the dungeon one of the nights together with his auntie Sayyida Zainab and the rest of the women. And on this cold night when all the children are sleeping, Sayyida, suddenly Sayyida Rukayya wakes up from her sleep. This Rukayya or who we call Sakina, this four-year-old daughter of Imam al Hussein Rukayya, she wakes up from her sleep by screaming and crying out. Say the Zainab al Kobra goes to her and she says, My daughter, my darling, why is it that you woke up from your sleep? Sayyida Rukhaya replies back by saying, Auntie Zainab, I saw my father in my dream. Allah Abdullah, I saw my father in my dream, and my father said, Oh Rukhaya, I am waiting for you. Soon we shall be reunited. Sayyida Rukhaya began to weep and cry. She she said, Auntie Zainab, I shall not go to sleep. Neither shall I continue without my father. I want my father tonight. He promised me in my dream that we will be together. The little girl cried her heart out until Yazid al woke up. They say that Yazid woke up due to the crying and the weeping. He asks his God, what has happened? Why is there weeping from the dungeon? The prison guard comes and says to Yazid, there is a little girl by the age of four. She misses her father. She is crying due to the grief of her father. Yazid al says, increase the grief of this girl by showing her the severed head of her father. The narrations mention that when the blessed head of Imam al Hussein was brought on attached on a tray, this little girl, she looked at the head of Imam, she hugged the severed head of Imam al Hussein. She cried her heart out. Is there anyone to have mercy on the orphans of Ali Muhammad? Ahibai, a few months back we had a funeral in London. A few months back we had a funeral in London. Somebody's father passed away. When we finished reciting Salatul Mayyit, the casket was in front of us. So they opened the casket and they opened up a coffin such that people are able to give their final farewell to the person who is deceased. By Allah, this person who lost his father, he was an adult. He was grown up. His father's body is intact. His father's body is in one piece. His father is going to be buried very shortly with honor and dignity. But when he saw the body of his father in a coffin, he cried so much he fainted out of grief. I say if an adult can faint while looking at the dead body of his father, then what about Rukhaya? This is a severed head without a body. <laughs> the narration says that she hugged the head of her father and she cried and she cried until she fell silent. The women think that Sayyid as Rukhaya has gone to sleep. Imam Zainul Abidin stands up and says, Oh Auntie Zainab, the soul of this child has left her body due to grief. <laughs> the hardest point in the life of Imam Zainul Abidin inside that dungeon of Sham was how do you dig the grave of your sister? A man who is a prisoner, Zainul Abidin, not a sword with him, not anyone to help him. He got down on his knees. He began to dig the sand with his hands. <laughs> Madloom Imam Zainul Abidin, a brother has to dig the grave of his baby sister. <laughs> 
May Allah, oh may Allah have mercy on us. I don't know how Imam Zainullah Bidin survived. They said for Imam Sajjad to dig the grave with his hands was difficult. I tell you, Ya Shia Ala Muhammad, what was more harder for Zainul Abidin was to cover the grave with the body of Rukhaya inside. Is there anyone to help Sajjad when he threw sand on the face of Rukhaya? Imam Zainul Abidin almost died out of grief. <laughs> the third incident, and this is the final incident. May Allah have mercy on your tears. 13th of Muharram. Allah Akbar. 13th of Muharram. Imam Zainul Abidin, by way of miracle, returns back from Kufa to Karbala to bury the Shuhada. Allah. Shuhada of Karbala have been left for three days on the plains without a ghusl, without a kafan, the wind blowing across these bodies covered in wood and sand. The narrations mentioned Imam Sajjad went to Karbala, he got Bani Asad to help him dig a marsh grave. And this marsh grave was divided into two parts. One part, the shuhada from Bani Hashim were buried in them. And one part, the rest of the ashab. Together, this one mass grave. May Allah grant each and every one of us the opportunity to visit Imam al Hussein in Karbala. This is the grave of the shuhada. This one grave that contains all the companions. One side, Bani Hashim, one side, the ashab. Imam Sajjad got the Bani Asad to help him to put down these bodies and cover them. Allahu Akbar. When he completed this, he moved towards the body of Imam al Hussein. Bani Asad thought that Imam Zainul Abidin will ask them, Imam Zainul Abidin, he will ask them to help in burying the body of Imam al Hussein over here. Imam Sajjad said, no, people of Bani Asad, now I shall bury my father, thank you. And he sends them back on the Amma Asum, Imam Bari Imam, Allahu Akbar, no other Imam has had to bury their father in the way that Imam Zainul Abidin had to bury his father. Allahu Akbar. The narrations mention, Arbab al Makatil mention that the grave of Imam al Hussein was dug by Rasulullah himself. Yani the Holy Prophet of Islam had already dug the grave of Imam. When Imam Sajjad moved the dust of Karbala, he saw that there is a grave already dug inside. The people of Bani Asad narrate this event. They said, We stood back while we watched Imam Zainul Abidin, how he would bury his father. The narrations mention that Imam Zainul Abidin tried to lift the body of Imam Al Hussein from the right side. And then Imam Zainul Abidin sat down. He cried. He stood up. He tried to lift the body from the left side. He couldn't. He sat down. They said, what happened? Imam Zainul Abidin says, every time I lifted the body from the right side, the left side of the body fell over. He says, every time I lifted the body of my father from the left, the right side of the body falls over. They said, why? He said, they trampled on the body of my father. One of the enemies, he describes the way in which the body of Imam al Hussein was trampled upon by horses. He says, we crushed the body of Imam al Hussein. We broke every bone in that body, mixing the broken bones and the skin with the sands of Karbala. <laughs> One rib of Fatima Tazahra, every bone in the body of Imam al Hussein was broken. <laughs> Who is there to help Sajjad? He lifts the body from one side, the other side falls over. He calls Bani Asad and asks them for a cloth, one big cloth. 
They come and they give him on Zainul Abideen. A cloth, he puts the cloth on the plains of Karbala. And how Imam Zainul Abideen does, don't ask me. But the translation of the words that I used is that Imam Zainul Abideen gathered the broken body of Hussein onto a single cloth to lower him into the grave. Allah, Allah. He lowered the grave, he lowered Imam al Hussein. he took him down on inside the grave. Allah, he took him down inside the grave. Ahibai, in our fiqh, in our sharia, fiqh ahlul bayt, fiqh ahlul bayt. It says that from the rules of burial, the regulations of burial, is that when you lower the body into the grave, you put it on the right side. And when you lower the grave on the right side, it is mustahab, and it is a requirement that you open up the coffin and you put the right cheek of the dead body on the sand of the grave. I tell you, the body Imam Zainul Abidin was buried. It's a body without a head. This is Imam buried his son in Karbala while the head is in the palace of Ibn Ziyad in Kufa. There was no head to put on the right side. The people of Bani Asad are waiting for Imam Zainul Abidin. They say he has not yet come out from the grave. They thought perhaps that he may have fainted inside the grave. When they say we went a little bit closer, we saw Imam Sajjad kissing the manhar of Abab. <laughs> the manhar is that part of the jugular vein. The manhar is that part of the neck from which the head of Imam al Hussein was suffering. <laughs> Imam Zainul Abideen, we can never understand the grief of Imam Zainul Abideen. The narrations mention, and this is my last moment, this is my last statement. The narrations mention Imam Zainul Abideen when he came out in when he came out of the grave. He began to walk around the grave of Imam al Hussein as if he is searching for something on the desert fields. Allahu Akbar. Sometimes he goes down on his knees. He uses his hands to separate the sand. Bani Asad are watching and observing the behavior of Imam al Sajjad until they see that he has reached a certain part, not too far from the body of Imam al Hussein. Imam Zainul Abid found something on the plains of Karbala. He sat down. He kissed this. He put it on his forehead. The people of Bani Asad said we came a little bit closer to see what did Zainul Abidin find on the plains of Karbala. Somebody thought it was a possession or some treasure that was stolen. He said when we went a little bit closer to see what is in the hands of Zainul Abidin, he said we saw a severed finger in the hands of the Sajjad. They asked him the story behind. They said, Zainul Abidin, we were not able to bury the bodies because they were separated from the heads. We couldn't identify them. They said, Zainul Abidin, whose body piece is this? Whose finger is this? Imam Sajjad shrieks. Allah, he shrieks and he says, this is the finger of my father, Hussein. How? Shabek Hariban, before Shabek Hariban, when they came to loot the body of Imam al Hussein, somebody stole his amama, somebody stole his slippers, somebody stole his rida, and then came a lie by the name of Huli. He tried to find something. He says everything is stolen from the body. Even the torn shirt of Imam al Hussein was removed. He said, I felt a lot of regret that I've missed out on stealing from Imam al Hussein. He says, I was about to walk back. Allah. He says, I was about to walk back and I looked at the body for one last time. Is there anything that I can steal? He says, I saw on the finger of Imam al Hussein there was a ring. I wanted that ring. Huli says, I tried to remove the 
the ring, the ring wouldn't come out. But I really wanted to steal this from Hussein because the ring would not come out. Cool, he says, I began to cut the finger of Hussein. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah